Hi everyone, I'm Joanna and I'm Director of Design and Innovation here at the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event, which has been made possible thanks to the support of our partners at Ravensbourne University, London. You'll find links in the chat for more information about their innovative master's course in Design for Social Innovation, which I've had the pleasure to lecture on for the past few years. The programme brings together a community of creative practitioners from across disciplines to collaborate on some of the world's most pressing challenges. So we really couldn't have had a more fitting supporter for today's conversation, which gathers four inspirational innovators who have applied their designer mindset to some of the big challenges of this extraordinary past year. An unprecedented global pandemic, the worst global economic recession since the Great Depression, the tipping point for systemic racism, growing polarization and conflict, an alarming increase in wildfires across five continents. Two decades ago, innovators, futurists and visionaries used 2020 as the year on the horizon to point to for what good might look like and for what we might aspire to achieve. And as that horizon drew closer, it grew more apocalyptic than aspirational. As Victor Papanek put it, all that we do almost all of the time is design, for design is basic to all human activity. It's human nature to design for need, to design for better, to design for change. We design at our best in times of uncertainty, urgency and crisis. Our designer mindset, whether we identify as designers or not, sees challenge as opportunity, not obstacle, learned through imagining, making, testing and iterating, not predicting, embraces ambiguity, a space for creativity, not anxiety, and approaches novelty with curiosity, not fear. Um, a design mindset also explores diversity with empathy and not judgment. So the crises of 2020 have created the perfect conditions for timely, relevant, optimistic and proactive responses amongst those of us who lean the most into that designer mindset, whether by nature or nurture. But despite some of its virtues, design has been far from hero. For the last century, as design as a mindset started finding its voice and its language, it started to um, fail to recognize its power, impact, and therefore responsibility. In reality, it's contributed to a lot of the social challenges in our world leading up to the crises of 2020. Design has been more biased and equitable. It's sided with short-termism over long-termism. It's focused on individualism over collectivism. It has concerned itself with winning over serving. And it has put people over planet. And contentious design has been the margin and not the mainstream. So what have we learned from how design has responded to the crises of 2020? What has design given 2020? And what has 2020 given design? And what does that mean for how we want our designer mindset to show up in 2021 and beyond? So we're welcoming today four global 2020 crisis responders to tell their stories of triumph and failure, pride and regret. From the thinkers creating COVID-19 response models for health and care communities in the UK, to the designers innovating towards carbon neutral cities in Zagreb. From the innovators improving bushfire community resilience in Australia to the tech entrepreneurs reducing polarization and conflict through social media in the US and Kenya. Our storytellers come from the design community and beyond, from grassroots to institutions. What they share in common is their design mindset, their resilience in the face of 2020 crises and their openness to share their learning with humility. So I would love to introduce you to our storytellers. Please meet Elena Puj Larori. Elena is director of Build Up, a nonprofit she founded in 2014 that works to identify and apply innovative practices to prevent conflict and to tackle polarization. Elena is a governance and peace building professional with over a decade of experience advising organizations around the world on the use of technology and innovation in peace processes. We're actually really excited to have partnered with Elena on this year's RSA Student Design Awards brief, Bridging the Divide. I'd also like to welcome Tom Tobaya, 
Tom's work tackles civic and societal challenges through physical experiments. He has led the early stage development of many projects and organizations, building new models of learning, working, community collaboration, and emerging technologies. Tom co-founded Makerversity, a campus for making and learning at Somerset House in London. He'll be sharing a story today from his recent work with Dark Matter Labs. Tom is also an RSA Student Design Awards alumni, a judge, and a longtime collaborator. Next, I would like to introduce RSA's own Ian Burbage, who heads our approaches to innovation and change across our programmes, and he's been developing the RSA's living change approach for the last few years. Ian has a background in public policy and partnership working and joins the RSA from local government. Ian is particularly interested in how to cultivate innovation within public services and to bring new approaches to all problems. Finally, I'd like to welcome Melanie Raymond. Melanie brings together her passion for design-led innovation to complex social issues. She's director at the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, TAXI, and was previously head of service design at Bernardo's in the UK. Melanie was a visiting lecturer at a number of universities and she hosts the podcast Moments of Change. So we'll start off by inviting our storytellers to share their stories of design's response to the crises of 2020. And we'll have time at the end to discuss these stories and to ask questions. You'll find in the chat the Twitter handles of the storytellers. So feel free to reach out to them and ask them any questions. And the hashtag for today's event is hashtag RSA design. So do join the conversation. So first up, Elena will be telling us her story titled, You Could Make This Place Beautiful. Over to you, Elena. Thank you for this invitation to, to speak at this event, uh, Joanna. Um, so at Build Up, um, one of the things that we're especially concerned with is the divisions that emerge as a result of the use of digital technologies. And we're paying attention in particular, as Joanna was, was pointing to, to the increasing polarization of online conversations, especially on social media, but also just in general, any conversation that is happening in online spaces. Um, and we've been monitoring for a number of years uh, how online conversations increase divisions and shape identities in ways that can fuel conflict. Um, and this is happening every, everywhere. Um, you know, Many of you have probably looked at, at what that looks like in the UK or in the US, but we're seeing it also in Kenya, in Myanmar, in Lebanon, in Libya. So we've really been taking a broad scan of how online conversations are developing and how they intersect with conflict. And so before 2020, um, there were a number of things that we were already beginning to understand, right? So let, let me tell you a little bit about that, because I think that's the beginning of the story sort of before um, the, the crisis of, of 2020. What we were seeing is that most disinformation online is really aimed at alienating a person or a group. Actually, that's the same of disinformation anywhere, right? But we can see that online very clearly. In other words, disinformation uses a lie to close debate, to simplify the narrative rather than to allow for plurality. That is a classic driver of conflict. And then what happens in online conversations that we were particularly, we were particularly looking at is that that lie spreads it becomes misinformation. So the difference is disinformation is something I put out with the intent to deceive, right? Misinformation is something that spreads because people don't realize that it's disinformation. Um, and the reason misinformation spreads fundamentally is that our brains kind of love heuristic simplicity. So the kind of information that is disinformation is, is very appealing to our brains. But the other thing that we were noticing is that it spreads more because most digital technologies amplify this human weakness, this love of heuristic simplicity. Most digital platforms have a surveillance capitalist business model. Their monetization strategy is to gather large amounts of data so they can build models or profiles for every individual. Um, and that, that can help predict the actions of that individual. Um, to get that data, they need users to engage again and again. And to drive engagement, they favor content that is simple and that we already agree with. It's not that algorithms couldn't push a different kind of content. Um, Catherine O'Neill, who wrote a very interesting book about the nature of algorithms, says that algorithms are opinions embedded in code. And so the opinion of most platform technologies or of most social media platforms is that they need more quantity of engagement from users, more of our attention on stuff, on any stuff, 
And fostering complexity doesn't serve as a tension extraction model very well. Okay, so that's already pretty bad. But there's another thing that we were starting to see prior to 2020, which is that even if an algorithm is presenting me with stuff that I agree with, I could go elsewhere, right? I could behave differently. I could post and share more nuanced content. Why don't people just not spread disinformation? Why do even your reasonable friends post kind of crazy stuff? The other way that digital technologies drive engagement is by pinging us all the time and creating an addiction to chasing those pings. We post for the, for the likes, we share for the laughs. The design of notifications is largely influenced by nudge theory, which was pioneered by the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University. And their theory of change is to hardwire habits. It's a manipulation tactic that changes the incentives our brains respond to. So algorithms and nudges are resulting in a gradual, slight, imperceptible change in, in your own behavior and perception. It is almost indistinguishable from magic. Ultimately, the subtle behavior change that surveillance capitalism trades in means we have less control over who we are and what we really believe. As individuals, because habit hardwiring is deeply influencing us, and as a collective, because we engage with different content and so have less of a shared understanding of reality. As a peace builder, this worries me deeply, even before 2020. Since 2017 at Build Up, we started to experiment with interventions in online conversations in the USA, we were, where we were seeing that this was really shifting the nature of political discourse. And what our interventions aim to do is to influence online, beha online behavior. So what we would do is we would look for people who were um, in some way exposed to polarizing conversations. Um, and we would send them a message. And the aim of that message was for them to reflect um, on the fact that they were in this polarizing environment. If they responded to that message, one of our trained facilitators would go in and have a platform with them on, on the platform itself. So, uh, sorry, a conversation with them on the platform itself. Um, and that conversation was aimed to be uh, a demonstration of how you could behave in a different way online. So really it was all about how could we shift behaviors online to, to address some of the issues that we were seeing about how online conversations drive conflict. And then came 2020, right? So in the weeks at the start of the pandemic, we started to hear from a lot of our networks that all these signals of polarization that we'd been talking about, that we'd been tracking and analyzing and trying to understand were everywhere. Even people who had previously thought that digital peace building, this thing that we were doing online was peripheral to real peace building began to change. They started to say, hang on a minute, this is really something we need to, to start thinking about. What was new was that the pandemic was providing fuel to further polarize. Misinformation about the pandemic is rife. I, I don't need to tell you that, everybody knows this. And it's also being used to exacerbate existing conflict divisions. There are so many examples of this. Let me just give you three. Um, in Northern Nigeria, there was a whole campaign talking about how Muslims were not actually affected by COVID. In India, the virus was depicted in online memes as a Muslim, in Muslim clothing, essentially. In Hungary, Viktor Orban um, had a campaign that then spread massively or online blaming immigrants for, for, uh, for COVID and so on. There were so many of them, right? The other thing that was also new, or not new, but there was more of it, is that even more of our life has, had moved online, right? So with social distancing in place, more of our conversations were moving online. Companies were reporting uh, a 12 to 15% increase in internet use, which across the whole population is, is a big deal, right? And much of that time is spent in poorly regulated internet forums and on social media. And in general, we've seen an uptick in forums that were promoting extremist views. So polarization online was getting much worse as soon as the pandemic started, um, both because the pandemic is fueling pure polarization with the kind of content that was being put out and also by the sheer volume of conversations that were happening online. And what we were noticing in our networks was this kind of sense of despair or not be, of not being able to get away from online polarization and not really knowing what to do about it. And so it became clear that there was no distinction between online and offline conflict. And we were in this kind of socio-technical ecology that's not abstract ever, anymore that everyone gets. So I think I'm a little bit short on time, but I'm gonna give you two examples of what our response was that. Is that still okay, Joanna? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so because of the of the um, of the the kind of work that we had done up to now, we realized that we were quite well positioned to to respond um, to this increase in online conversations. Um, and so there's a number of things that we did. I wanted to to just mention two. One is in Kenya, um, we worked on a thing called the Mascani Commons. Um, what this was, was we, we noticed that a lot of this, we had been in touch with a university in Western Kenya, and a lot of the students start, started talking um, about um, how when they turned to social media in the weeks after being sent home, um, they, they were really, um, they were turning to social media in order to get more information about COVID. Um, and even though that they knew they knew social media would increase their fear and anxiety, they were still kind of stuck in this uh, social media ecosystem. So we developed this intervention where um, students look at the way that conversations polarize online, and then they intervene in those conversations using nonviolent communications to shift the way that people behave online. Um, and that was really it was really interesting how COVID really galvanized the students to to actually do something about online polarization. In the USA, we already had a program um, that was about tackling online conversations and, and online polarization. But what happened that was different is that we realized this was no longer a time lim limited intervention. This wasn't about just addressing a moment of polarization, but polarization online was a whole thing that was determining the way that, that, uh, that we understand the world. Um, and so really what we're doing now is we're essentially creating an ongoing practice, a movement of people who engage differently on social media and who try and spread that practice of behaving in a depolarizing way online. I think the underlying drive behind these two um, uh, pieces of work in Kenya and in the USA um, is to acknowledge that social media is really a scary place of polarization and fragmentation, but that it can also be a place of connection and plurality, which is exactly what we need during the pandemic. And people know this instinctively, and they want more of the connection and plurality and less of the polarization and fragmentation. Um, they're really hungry for this kind of work. And so sometimes all that we do is say to people, hey, listen, you could make this place beautiful. It doesn't need to be the way that you're seeing it. Um, it can really be a place where we connect um, and we collaborate rather than a place where we fragment and we polarize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, for this fascinating story. I think what really struck me is that um, you sort of designed these interventions to happen exactly at the right time, in the right place, on the platform, and targeting the right people, um, but then to collectively try and shift that online behaviour. So we'll be able to unpack that a little bit more in the plenary. Um, thank you for that. Um, I am now going to hand over to Tom to share his story uh, titled unprecedented constraints and how 90s nostalgia helped overcome them. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, good morning. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this as well. <clears throat> um, before I jump into the story, I thought I'd just uh, let you know about how my uh, 2020 started. And, and um, I made a decision in, in February to take on some work um, to, that would involve uh, going around Europe and working with different cities across Europe, because I decided that it was the moment in in my life where I needed that kind of uh, immersion in different cultures to further my practice um, and that dream lasted about 10 days before it completely uh, fell apart and I, I, I was hoping to spend some time in southern Europe and I, I don't think I've made it out of South Yorkshire for the last nine months so uh, things got off to an interesting start um, but I'm going to tell you two stories today that kind of intertwine and meet in the middle and um, I'll tell you a story about big things um, and I'll tell you a, a story about smaller things as well um, and how they've both uh, been affected by by what's happened in 2020 and how they've how they've met in the middle. So to start with uh, a story, the big story is about things. So it's about how a huge change in conditions has opened up possibilities um, and enabled people. And by people in this context, I mean cities. Uh, most of my work is with cities across Europe um, have been forced into imagining and living alternate states. Um, and that's encouraged people to think about uh, how they might manage that in future proactively as opposed to purely reactively. The little stories about people and how building relationships in a time of remote working has been a, an interesting challenge and one that has been fundamental to unlocking some of the things uh, that I will be telling you about in the, in the big story. So just to contextualize this as well, these stories are both positive. Um, that's not too ignore the obvious negatives and suffering that's, that 
uh, most people have gone through in, in 2020. But um, I'm going to take this opportunity to share what's been good through that bad situation. I think we've all had enough bad news over the last few months. So uh, we'll, we'll stick to the good for now. So the big story is really uh, about money and specifically about revenue. So something happened in March this year as cities across Europe went into lockdown, um, and that is that their revenue crashed overnight. So most cities reported a drop in about of about 30% of their revenue, um, be that through transport or venues or various forms of tax. Uh, money just disappeared overnight. And that pushed people into a very interesting space. It was a, obviously a short-term disaster, uh, but it also created a really interesting space as well. And uh, I'm sure most of you um, will, have, will have come across the analogy of boiling a frog. So if you put a frog into cold water and boil it, they, it gets warmer and warmer and doesn't notice until it's too late that something's wrong. If you put it into boiling water, it notices and jumps out straight away. So March this year was the moment of putting people into boiling water, so to speak. So there was such an obvious change overnight that it couldn't be ignored and accepted as something that was just happening over time. Um, and as a result, that experience and that shared experience of a seismic change um, meant that people suddenly realised that their kind of worst case, scenario, worst case scenarios were potentially real uh, as opposed to hypothetical. And the upshot of that has been that people have started to think in a more long-termist way, um, particularly uh, in, in cities, planning for the future. We heard from Joanna at the start about the kind of future 2020 vision. Um, I think that the idea that there is a date further in time than we can imagine operationally that we can aspire towards is a very interesting one. Um, but ultimately, it remains hypothetical, and that's that's a serious challenge. What happened this year is that that hypothetical became real. So suddenly, we have conditions that we have to plan for that we may not have thought would happen in in the next twenty or thirty years. Um, and that the financial side of that. So this is this being a story about money. The 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 revenue side of that meant that people needed to think about how you run and manage a city that perhaps doesn't have money in the same way that it used to. And there are other very interesting. Uh, directions that you can look at that problem from, not least the climate crisis. So suddenly uh, we had a, a petri dish, an experimental area uh, where we could talk to cities uh, about imagining a future where the climate crisis disrupts your understanding of the world order. And that moment of, of being able to relate to something changing massively uh, has been a very useful thing as we've moved in through 2020 to explore things. And nowhere has that been more visceral than in Zagreb. So Zagreb uh, had a, a left right in March this year. It had a double whammy where suddenly um, it was faced with a national lockdown and then was hit with an earthquake on the 22nd of March of this year. Um, the earthquake struck just as lockdown took hold. About 26,000 buildings were damaged. About five and a half billion euros worth of damage was done. Um, so suddenly you have a situation where lots of people are homeless or living in homes that have been damaged. They're also uh, in uh, a pandemic and in a lockdown. And this is a, an incredibly perilous state to imagine. Um, and the immediate response from Zagreb as a city, completely understandably, was how do we, how do we get back to what we, what we had in February of this year? We need to get back to normal with this as quickly as possible, particularly from a housing lens. It's the, you know, it's the almost at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the idea that you have a roof over your head. And that was suddenly a, a real risk for a lot of people. Um, but simultaneously, people were understanding that it wasn't just the earthquake that had disrupted reality in the city, but COVID itself had created a situation where people were having to imagine a, a very different way of conducting activity on a day-to-day -day basis and think to the future in terms of what that might feel like beyond COVID uh, and with other challenges on the horizon, uh, climate crisis being a, a key one. So... We were, we were able to uh, start conversations with Zagreb as a city around future fitting. So that is building back better rather than building back to something that we consider to be normal. Um, and the result of the conditions that were created in March through COVID arriving and revenue dropping was that people were much more open to exploring what that might look like and what it might be from a proactive standpoint. So let's build back better. Let's think about how if we uh, improve the um, carbon footprint of the houses that people live in in Zagreb, if we, if we strive for carbon neutrality, 
how that potentially unlocks future revenue streams through things like selling energy back to the grid, how it prevents you needing as much revenue in future with utilities bills and social housing dropping um, with, with better quality build materials used. And that space was opened up and created in a way that I don't think any of us thought would, would happen as a result of the conditions that, that we were facing. Suddenly everyone was in the same boat and understanding that things happen and things that you think might be hypothetical can happen. That veneer of comfort in normality was ruptured um, and it, it enabled people from uh, design backgrounds or not to better imagine what alternate states might be. So we've been working with Zagreb to, uh, to imagine how a carbon neutral housing future would look and feel in Zagreb itself. Um, and within that is embedded this idea of revenue resilience. So building in the capacity for a city to withstand shocks uh, to its revenue in future. Um, there are also some other really interesting facets to, to the work that have come about as a result of the, the, uh, the COVID crisis. So one of them is that contracts themselves, so contracts for housing, but for almost everything, any kind of service provision need to be reimagined as well. You can't really hold people to a contract when their revenue evaporates overnight due to a pandemic. It, it, it breaks the mould that is, that is a, a, a public contract as we understand. Um, and that's something we don't have an answer to, but it is a very interesting question that everybody now has to accept is real. So contracts have been something which have been um, problematic in, in in the work that I've done for, for many years. They, they are a, a blunt instrument more often than not. Um, and they're used as a weapon rather than a tool. Uh, it now feels like there is the condition here, conditions here where we may start to think about using contracts as a tool uh, to support people to be more resilient rather than as a weapon to hold people to account, which is a very exciting change. Equally with governance, um, particularly in Zagreb, where we had this twin challenge of an earthquake and COVID hitting at almost exactly the same time. There were just too few people with too many decisions to make. Um, there is, a, again, an ongoing challenge around uh, hierarchical decision making that happens, particularly within city municipalities, um, but at almost every level of organisations and government. Um, but suddenly there's a situation where not only uh, is that a, a problem of uh, morality and ethics, but it's also a, just an operational impossibility. So suddenly decision making needs to be distributed uh, much more widely to people who are much further down the, the, the chain of command in a normal situation. And that becomes really exciting because decisions can become much more localized, they can become much more specific to answering needs, um, and they can empower and encourage people who normally wouldn't necessarily feel an attachment to the, uh, the place that they work or the role that they play in, in the organization of that system to, to take an active role in that and to start building responsibility into their work in that way. Ultimately as well, if you, if you are sharing decision-making in that way, decision-making needs to be in the open more, uh, which is, uh, again, a platform that's fantastic uh, for, for people to, to live in a more egalitarian society. And Zagreb, again, we've seen that as decisions about social housing and housing in general uh, across the city has moved from being something which is owned by a planning department down to uh, building managers of individual apartment blocks who are custodians of those buildings. So we start asking questions at that kind of level, uh, which becomes a very exciting place to start building personalised responses to, to major challenges that everybody is facing. And the key thing with this really, I think, is that these, these cracks in the way that things just work, the kind of operational dark matter that exists uh, within uh, municipalities and society in general, um, is, is a space that needs filling. It can't just be a space that opens up and everyone says, what do we do? It's a space that needs filling quickly with um, ideas and thoughts and platforms uh, that can encourage people to feel a sense of comfort that there are opportunities within this that, that they may not have seen otherwise. And that really feels like the role that, that we have had to play. We're, we're, we've got a lot of things wrong in that process, but the fact that there, there are things that we've been thinking about uh, proactively prior to this moment arriving, that we can start to drop into these environments feels like a really important, important thing to make sure that people uh, have a sense of comfort and direction when things aren't feeling great. And as I said, that is a very hit and miss process, but it's, uh, it's an important one nonetheless. So that's the big story, the big story about uh, conditions at a city level. I've just touched on the idea that, that there needs to be a sense of comfort. And that moves nicely onto the small story, which is about people and relationships.
Now, as I said, uh, I'd plan to build some some great relationships with people across Europe this year um, by going to the pub in Tallinn or, uh, you know, going hiking in the mountains near Zagreb or whatever it was. Um, ultimately, none of that's been possible. Um, and instead, we've had to look at building relationships in a really different way this year. Um, we were meant to be be on the ground working together and, and enjoying that creative space that you have when you are rubbing up against each other on, on, a, on a day to day basis. Um, but in lieu of that, what's been very interesting is that everybody through the COVID crisis has had that removed from their lives at exactly the same time. And everybody has been seeking the same thing, which is comfort and connection with other people. And that has created a space in which people operate in a much more, or certainly at the start of this, uh, of this crisis, operated in a much more egalitarian way. Um, the the, the uh, pageantry that surrounds uh, things like uh, municipalities and mayoral organisations um, disappeared overnight as people were forced into scenarios that they they couldn't have imagined. Um, we we sort of recognised this quite early on, which was which was very useful to building relationships as we moved into new work across Europe in in April and May this year. And we were looking for ways to build on this so that we could start to build relationships with people. Um, that we were going to be working with for the coming year or two. Um, and one of the things that we hit upon that had been a big uh, a big hit across Europe in, in the 90s was MTV. Um, we realised that most people were um, probably 70s and 80s children that we were going to be working with, which means that they were largely teenagers in the 90s, uh, myself included. So the very first time that I met the mayors and deputy mayors um, of all these cities was giving an MTV Cribs tour of my house, including a shouting toddler. Uh, I showed off my newly sprouted tomato seedlings, uh, a kitchen full of washing up sort of lingering in the background that I tried to ignore but couldn't really ignore. Uh, I tripped over the, the, the spare bedroom in the room that I was working as a studio and had to explain why there was a bed in there and that that was because I needed to lie down when I was having difficult conversations with my colleagues and things like that. So it became a, a light-hearted joke, basically, a way of engaging with people people in, in the real me. Um, and so after I'd gone, everybody followed. So uh, I found out that the, uh, the CDO in, in Tallinn was working from his child's bedroom and that his wife was a kid's cartoon character designer. So he, he appeared on a video screen with hundreds of cuddly toys behind him, uh, which then opens a conversation that you would never normally be able to have with somebody uh, in that level if you were meeting them in person in their, in their big office in, in the municipal building in the centre of town. And it was that space that, that we, uh, through happenstance really, managed to start exploring um, uh, as, as a really rich space for building personal relationships with people during a crisis. We built on the thing that everybody was craving, which was this sense of connection to other people and being transported into other spaces that we couldn't, couldn't be at, at, at that time. And those conditions enabled us to build a level of trust that went beyond the idea of trust being uh, a sense of reliability. So I'm going to, I promise you that my work will be reliably good to a sense of trust that was based on belonging. So I promise you that I'm doing everything I can. You can see me for who I am. You can see my vulnerabilities. I can see yours. And that trust is much more elastic than the trust of reliability. So at a time where it's almost impossible to be reliable, because things are happening that are out of all our, of our control, what you can do is be elastic with the trust that you give and receive. And that formed a huge part of us being able to work together positively to imagine new spaces, uh, new opportunities with cities, and to do so in an experimental way. So that was a, a huge success. And that brings us back round really to, to the first part of the story, which is how do you uh, create the conditions where you're able to collectively be proactive in imagining long-term um, resilience and build, uh, building of resilience in, in organisations and cities. And my feeling is the answer to that is that we want to build a sense of trust based on belonging wherever we possibly can so that we are working together towards things. And that's that, again, is something that has been possible really because of the conditions and the constraints that were, were forced upon us at the start of this year. And ultimately, just to finish off, uh, those constraints are things that designers love, right? So constraints are what stop design being art, ultimately, really. So we've embraced those constraints. Um, we've got a lot wrong as this year has gone on. Um, but we've also had some, some really nice experiences, some great stories, and made some friends where we perhaps wouldn't have otherwise, which has been fantastic. Um, 
My question really is whether or not when things return to quote unquote normal and the constraints are removed, whether we hang on to some of those uh, positive behaviours and good outcomes. Great, thank you so much, Tom, for, for these fascinating stories. I think what really resonated with me is um, your, um, your point around uh, disrupting governance um, and when twin crises hit, you know, there are, too, there are too few people and too many decisions to make and you need sort of a, the right mix of capabilities. So you need to distribute decision making into communities. And that really resonates with what happened in Beirut after the, 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 the explosion. Um, earlier in the year when you know it was the, the city was experiencing a pandemic a, a depression an economic depression and the yeah and and the explosion happened um and actually the, the majority of those who did who were involved in the search and rescue and rebuild initiatives were actually just volunteers and, and members of the local community um so thank you for that so we'll be able to come back to some of these stories later but next up is ian who will be sharing his story um, about riding the Corona coaster. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, glad to be here. Good to meet everybody joining us uh, online. Um, I'm going to share some stories that I heard in the summer in some community groups I was lucky enough to engage with as part of some work I was doing with the School for Social Entrepreneurs. Um, and, and really, this is just an opportunity for me to reflect on what we can learn uh, about the need for flexibility and responsiveness in the face of uncertainty. And I guess uh, that's uh, something that I think a design approach can offer, whether people themselves associate as, as being a designer or not. So I thought I'd go back to uh, early summer and share some of their stories. Uh, here, here are some of their voices that, that I heard in, in June. So we were still in lockdown at this point. There's fear, anxiety and worry amongst parents services and support networks that used to exist are now not running. We've changed our activities, adapted to running an emergency food relief project rather than doing our online, uh, rather than doing our group activities. Have set up a phone-based befriending service, partnering younger and older isolated people, moving all radio production and contact to phone and web-based learning and outreach, managed to pivot funding and get some more in to support our project. With a physical center being closed, delivery of sessions to adults with disabilities has been done via video, CDs, and even tapes. For most of our young people, home is not home as we know it. Home to them is injurious and chaotic. We've extended support hours and also offer support to family members who have very little parenting skills. Our, engaged, our service delivery is now remote this has meant no working face-to-face, -face, no mentoring in schools, etc. The sole focus has been to continue engagement and keep children and young people safe. It was quite quite emotional to read back through the notes and uh, dig into to the you know the sense of where everybody was back in back in the summer, uh, and I thought it was a useful framing really to then take this story forwards. And I guess when we're trying to make sense of the world, we, we not only seek those stories uh, the here and now, but we look at the history of, of how we've got to this point in time. And clearly, you know, recognizing that we, we interpret events through our own filters, through our own experiences. In the, in the UK, um, I, for me, a big part of the story is, is austerity. Uh, we've seen local government budget cuts emasculated, uh, handed down from central government over the last decade or more. So we've got a perfect storm of service cuts, disinvestment in some of our most um, needy communities and rising demand for critical services. You know, many people are already living with poor health, with um, lack of opportunity, food poverty, economic insecurity and so on before the pandemic hit. And, and the net effect is to reduce our resilience. And I think not just individually and collectively, um, in our homes, in our communities, and, and in our organisations. And, you know, this has led to a marginalisation of large areas of the UK and led to particular groups of our population being um, vulnerable. And we kind of see what happens when something like a pandemic hits. So we could argue that on top of those pre-existing crises, if you like, um, as, as I think Tom was saying, with what happens when multiple crises hit? Well, now we've got something that's landed on top of all of that. 
And I heard someone uh, say that a crisis will seek to accelerate and amplify pre-existing trends. You know, sometimes that will intensify fault lines that already exist and reveal deep structural challenges. And sometimes it will offer opportunities for change and for hope. So how, how might we respond then? Um, and how might design respond to these challenges and, and opportunities? I'm going to contrast a couple of different approaches. Um, the first, perhaps uh, uh, slightly more uh, traditional and linear approach. You know, we might decide that the first thing we need to do is to stop and uh, refresh our strategic goals or revise our vision statement to better reflect, you know, the changing world that we're now in. And then having done so, our task becomes to work towards that vision from where we are now. Yet we'll inevitably be in some respects, partially blinkered to the possibilities of the present as they emerge through our relentless focus on our, on our new vision. So if we're trying to logically plan our way ahead based on an analysis of cause and effect relationships, uh, perhaps a review of the literature on good practice responses when faced by a pandemic, you know, then, then kind of is this, is, is this the right way to go? By the time we've seen what's going on and we've diagnosed the challenge, dreamed up some solutions, turned them into a specification, put the brief out to market, evaluated tenders, concluded a contracting process, hosted a kickoff meeting, started to develop delivery plans. You know, this is the sort of the laborious linear approach to old fashioned way to contracting that Tom was referencing as well. You know, you kind of get the point. There's a, there's a time and a place for this approach and it works well in ordered environments where there's clear good practice available, you know, when there's more certainty. But we need something different. Uh, and I think this is where a, a sort of a design approach might come to the table. Can we be more flexible? in order to design uh, responses in uh, you know, these kind of scenarios of complexity and uncertainty. For me, I think we need to get comfortable with the emergent nature of the situation and figure out how we take our next step forwards together. And there's a great quote from Anne Pendleton Julian, who says, designing for emergence is designing for change in a context or system already in motion. Every interaction changes the system. And the community groups that I listened to in the summer were illustrating the importance of this. They were continuously scanning their environment and their community to see what was changing. And they were using that feedback to inform their next actions. And as I said, some more quotes about that response. It's amazing what can be achieved when we have to think on our feet. There's a real feeling that now is the time to reevaluate and do things differently. Now's not a time to be perfect. Sometimes raw content and just stepping up in a situation is key. Not knowing what the future holds and not being able to plan or prepare, exploring new avenues or possibilities, reacting to keep the business afloat, tapping into funding streams, not allowing for much reflection or strategizing being flexible to future crises. I think they saw the needs presenting in front of them and they reacted, they did something. And as those needs have changed over the months, so has their work. They didn't standardize, they absorbed the variety. They reacted to emergence, they didn't excessively plan or follow fixed delivery models. And as opportunities presented themselves, so they responded. They were able to see what works and what doesn't. And I saw them amplifying the former and moving on from the latter. I had a great check-in last week where I heard all of the updates from, from the different groups and the number of times in which they'd twisted and turned responding to the changing need in their communities um, was really quite um, uplifting to see and to hear. Would they think of themselves as designers? Well, if I asked them, probably not. Yeah, I would argue that they were all to some extent designing their service or their business, their community group on the fly, responding to the world and systems and relationships as they changed around them. They were, in a sense, living change. And that's what we mean at the RSA when we use that phrase. Uh, we talk about people who can think systemically and act entrepreneurially, who can see the bigger picture 
and the opportunity to act within it. And I think that's what those um, stories from from the the north um, the northwest in England. I think that's what those stories are, are are sharing with us, are telling us. And I think people who are working in those ways, with that with that approach, are going to be needed now more than ever. And as Joe said, and uh, others before me, we, we're not living through a single crisis. We're living through many. Uh, Joe listed some of those out, from social and racial justice to climate change and poverty. Uh, and there will be crises to follow, precipitated by COVID, of course, uh, especially around unemployment, mental health, and so on. Uh, I can't, for me, I, I just can't imagine we're going to look back and see 2020 as simply the year of the pandemic. I, I, I suspect we'll look back and see the 20s as the decade of crises. And I'm interested in uh, how will we learn from the coronavirus in order to uh, equip ourselves to be able to respond as effectively as possible as these crises emerge and as we need to, to continue to work towards addressing them. So to, to sum up, I'll, I'll quote one of the community business leaders in particular, who I thought really captured all of this for me. And she said, she said this, she said, it's the feeling of riding a Corona coaster of wobbles, overwhelming days, but then days of great inspiration and of communities working together to tackle the issues. Thanks, Jane. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Um, it's really striking um, that, that dichotomy you talked about between sort of a linear way of thinking and doing and sort of the dynamic or the living way of thinking and doing. And it's, um, yeah, it's absolutely true in terms of how we set out, we set up contracts, we set up the delivery and the development of activities for social change. A lot of that has been done in a very linear way, and it's not really fit for the types of change that we're experiencing and will likely continue to experience for the next few years in terms of how dynamic we need to be thinking and acting. So that's a really, really helpful um, uh, distinction between these two approaches. Um, I'm next um, going to hand over to Melanie to talk about nurturing community-led responses to bushfires. Melanie, over to you. Thank you, Joanna, and um, thank you very much for inviting me here today to speak. I'd like to first start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung land of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne. And I recognise that all the lands in Australia are unceded and I'd like to pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and recognise their deep connection to land and sea and give my thanks to Elders past, present for their knowledge. And I extend that respect to all First Nations people that might be joining us today. Before COVID, uh, across the summer of 2019 and into 2020, Australia burned um, and its heart was ripped open in a way that we'd really not experienced before. The traditional lands of many people were in deep distress and we were deeply powerless to stop it. Um, the sky turned night uh, for days upon end. Uh, ash rained from the sky up to hundreds of kilometres away from the fire front and thick smoke uh, stopped everyday life. It's estimated that more than a, mil a billion animals have died, more than 18 million hectares of land have burned in Australia. And to give you an example, that's equivalent in the UK of if you drew a square from South, uh, South End on Sea, across to Exeter, up to Chester and across and close that square. So that's a significant portion of England or the equivalent. And for the sake of clarity or misconception, this is not arid wasteland, but ecologically and culturally significant rainforest, grasslands, farming land, and of course, towns. Over 3,000 homes were destroyed, 478 people sadly lost their lives, and many people had no water to fight the fires due to the three years of crippling drought that came before this. So this was a time when many of us were celebrating the festive season and the typical rhythms and rituals of the summer holidays with families and friends had suddenly changed. And whilst living with fire is, you know, somewhat of a way of life in Australia, uh, and it's a part of the natural regenerative cycle of the bush, this was really, really different. And we were all overwhelmed at the powerlessness that we felt to stop it or the action um, and the sheer level of response required to address it. 
And so for us in Australia, the age of the Anthropocene was really here to kick our front door in. And this event must be and is a catalyst for change in our world. So earlier this year, my colleagues at the Australian Centre for Social Innovation were invited by a major funder to support them in understanding, you know, what role could they play to support communities following these bushfires in the months and the years to come? And what would constitute helpful help for communities? Because even though billions of dollars were flowing to them and there were gaps, there were things missing and there were barriers. So together with these partners, we've really set out to understand what role might we play in stewarding recovery and build towards a resilience that supports communities so that they might continue to strengthen their responses to adapt and cope in the face of ongoing climate disasters. Now, whilst many people are working tirelessly around the clock and still do to this day, we knew that communities were cut off and are cut off from services, communication and support. And many people continue to say that they feel abandoned. And so after the initial emergency response, the journey is long and slow over years. Funding from government and civic society comes with strings attached and, and high barriers to access and a real strong bias to infrastructure needs. So communities were frustrated at their lack of voice and agency in these efforts and the agendas set by others, actions done to them. But of course, all during heightened states of individual and collective trauma. One man actually said to us, you know, I felt angry at Mother Nature as the green shoots emerged again and thought, how dare you show up like nothing has happened. And this demonstrates the sheer scale of devastation and a, a year on people still are in this survival mode and the impact to the human psyche is, is, is real. And I heard just today that the effects of this is still felt um, deeply by communities who have experienced fires 30 years ago. And so we spoke to people um, who were working two and three jobs to having to advocate for their families and their communities. And one woman said that, you know, her dad would not even be able to entertain having a conversation with us. But what we know uh, in post-disaster responses, as um, others have commented, is this, this real social fabric that the ties that bind us together as a community can be frayed or even severed in these instances. And for those First Nations people, those ties of deep kinship, cultural and spiritual connections to each other, to place span generations. And so noticeably absent from these narratives of recovery uh, were the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and those who've experienced disadvantage from the negative effects of systems and policies and mindsets that have baked in inequity. And so this event was really another blow in a long and historical and cultural narratives of trauma. And one Ewan man said to us, you know, the last six months of bushfire have been difficult, sure, but it's nothing compared to the 250 years of trauma we have suffered here. And so for communities who've experienced a number of challenges, this is just one event in that long line of social and economic and cultural histories. And so with that, they bring these narratives and these articulation of identities and the plurality of those identities into this crisis environment. And so what we've set out with our partners is to really build a place-based model to enable and support change to enable communities to not only respond and to cover, recover, but to thrive in a way that seeks to address inequalities and to do so in the means of our living planet. And so in order to do this, we really believe that we must partner with communities and those associations and institutions to build the conditions, the capacities and the approaches for strengthening transformative resilience to bushfires. And to shift power and voice of communities really to the centre of recovery efforts so that recovery was not only informed by community, but truly a process that, is, process that is owned and led by community and to fund differently in a participatory manner so that through the process itself, it was healing and that funding found its way into the gaps to rebuild those rhythms and rituals of the social fabric of communities. And so following that initial design process, we're really at the beginning of testing this um, experimental model across uh, three initial communities uh, to build that cap 
ability and capacity and support the emergence of new perspectives and policies and services and approaches. But we knew that we had to start really slow. There was lots of people piling in after this uh, in an extractive manner. And so we really had to be careful to work authentically and be prepared to stay the course because recovery and the processes that follow are across uh, a number of years. And to work with the networks and support the emergence of that new leadership and robust forms of participation and participatory funding. And so those program levels, uh, there's three levels that are working concurrently um, across the sort of five to 10 year period that we're now entering into. And at a local level, it's really about walking alongside people to build those capabilities slowly and restore and nurture social networks, work authentically as friends and allies. And our work is to support people to further self-organise, establish new community roles and organisations and support participatory processes of getting money into communities through a series of small grants in untied manners and, of course, and access uh, larger grants to fund their needs now and their visions into the future. And across that broad level, we're working at, um, to act as a bridge uh, across institutional layers and, in, and into organisations and for community to be actually in control of uh, millions of dollars of, of funding to invest in uh, to change at a regional and national level and to find new ways to collaborate with this, uh, with this system to address the structural and policy and upstream changes that need to, need to be tackled um, and to scale that learning. And then really uh, there's an important factor of really establishing a community network from, from within to build peer-to-peer -peer, peer learning networks across communities and connecting them to greater access to data and evidence and to build coalitions to advocate for broader systemic changes on the issues that actually they define and matter them most. So in looking towards the future, I think the hope for us is that um, for all of us to take hold of this as a real opportunity to not take the path to snap us back to what was there before, but actually consider what is the transformative path forward and to right some wrongs. The sheer potential of people uh, throughout this process is astounding. Um, we speak to people and people can see the interactions and the outcomes of the systems around them. And communities really have that power and that wisdom and that imagination to look towards the future, but people just need a chance. And so we deeply and actively need to listen. And in this uh, design's role is not, not to solve the issues, but to create the conditions in which this power and this wisdom and this imagination is brought to bear and so that we can walk alongside these communities. And if government and philanthropy and civil society act in uh, true service as an enabler and follow the lead of these communities, we can actually help them reevaluate the way in which we define support. Um, and it's the opportunity and the responsibility of designerly ways of working here is, is really to embed this across these organisations, these groups and these institutions to enable a redesign of the way that we organise, those feedback loops that hold these current unhelpful ways of seeing and acting in, in the world in place. And so in all of this, I think it's really uh, a, a time to let go of ego-driven design and act in truly healing-centred ways to, for, for us to create restorative experiences for all of those people who have experienced the multiple crises of 2020 and all of those that came before. And this is really a chance for us to right injustices and to address power asymmetries and raise up Indigenous knowledge and dramatically face into the climate emergency, to steward compassionate endings to things that no longer serve us, and to steward the coming together of different people to co-create new perspectives together so we can really go in and forward and ask, what do we wish to evolve to and as? Thank you. Amazing, thank you, Melanie. That's, um, that's really thoughtful, actually, and, um, it mirrors actually your point when you talk about the need to invest in communities to, to be able to provide them with the opportunity or the chance to create the conditions for resilience actually really mirrors um, Ian's point around years of austerity and how that's actually placed those who are at risk um, uh, to be even more at risk, to be more, even more, more vulnerable. So there's absolutely um, a key learning here in terms of how we 
create the right conditions for resilience and for proactive response um, to the crises that, that we have experienced and that we're likely um, going to be continuing to experience in the next few years. Thank you so much for that thoughtful story. Um, so I, um, I have actually a couple of questions um, on the back of the stories I've just heard. Um, Ian and Tom talked about the need for design emergence um, and the fact that, you know, we can't be, we're not living in a predictable or a reliable world. So what are the sort of the mindsets that we need to, we need to embody and we need to embrace and, and talk, they talked about the value of a designer mindset. Um, Melanie and Ellen, I'm interested from your perspective, how you see embracing a designer mindset um, helpful or useful um, in your own uh, responses to crises. You know, it, I think it's interesting because uh, I'm not a designer by training, um, but um, I do actually, a design mindset has come up um, in our team a number of times, and we actually do have a number of people who, who have a, a background in design. And I would say there are three ways in which it has influenced um, the way that we do our work. Um, one is um, to be aware of the design that is around us. So. Um, I, I spoke about the, you know, the way that the plat that platforms are influencing the way we hold conversations, the way we express narrative and our identity. And a lot of that comes down to design decisions um, by the social media companies, right? And so I think having an understanding of what is the, what, what might have been the design mindset of those who put together social media platforms allows us to better understand the incentives that, that are affecting our behavior. So I think that's one thing. I think the second one, um, when it comes to the way that we design interventions on social media, um, is that the, the peace building practice that we bring to social media is called nonviolent communications. And nonviolent communications um, has three pillars uh, very broadly. It's um, non-judgment. So you, you try to approach people without judging um, and, and just kind of, and then the second one is listening. So you try to listen with non-judgment. And then the third one is collaboration. So you approach any kind of, uh, of work as a collaboration. And it's very interesting because, you know, in, in our team, we have sort of peace builder and we have designers and the designers are like, but that's just human centered design. I mean, this is just essentially, you're just saying, you know, you need to design your intervention in a way uh, that is uh, taking into consideration how others are going to interact with what you're doing. Um, and so I think, that kind of melding of nonviolent communications and human-centered design has been really important for us. And then the last one, which may be really obvious and, and almost uh, silly for, for this audience, um, is, is testing and iteration, um, which is also in response to this idea of emergence that, that Ian and, and Tom brought up. You know, we were one of the reasons why people don't try to depolarize conversations on social media is because it seems like an impossible task. Um, and what we said is, well, can we just bite off these like tiny things and do A-B testing? So if I say this, how are people going to react? Okay, let's measure it. Can we get some metrics on how people respond to this wording versus this wording? And that very simple kind of iterative process of testing and allowing our the flexibility to change our intervention um, has been incredibly powerful. So. Great. Thank you, Elena, for that. Um, Melanie, did you want to add to that? Yeah, um, thanks, Joanna. Um, look, I, I am myself a designer and I'm deeply passionate about design, um, but thinking about the role of design in this work, um, you know, we are informed by designly ways of working, um, you know, to undertake rigorous experimentation and that sort of really authentic and deep participatory practices for finding new ways forward. But I think when I was reflecting on this today, much of the work today and moving forward, you know, really distinctly draws from such a broad range of disciplines and practice. And so, you know, design does have its limitations. And so we must humbly say that we don't have all the answers. Um, but what I do think design brings is this opportunity for this meeting place. And it's a meeting place that I think really together brings that vast array of expertise, the diversity of the knowledge that without it, we couldn't, you know, find new ways forward. And so I think in, in creating that meeting space with the languages and the practice that um, of bringing people together in this way really brings uh, a 
provides us an opportunity to bring that practice wisdom, that research expertise and that lived experience together so that we can really collectively find completely new perspectives and new ways forward and, and codify and scale those learning um, uh, and approaches in, in really accessible ways. So. Great, thank you, Melanie. I think um, sort of um, reminds me of a metaphor I often use when I talk about a design mindset, which is very much around sort of creating the, the container um, within which different people from you know different areas of expertise can really sort of come together with the right sort of constructive and iterative and um, optimistic mindsets to try and sort of address a, a challenge together. So that really sort of speaks to that. Um, we're, we're running out of time. I would love to sort of spend, uh, you know, the rest of the day talking uh, talking to all of you and hearing more about your experiences. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, the stories you've, you've shared have been absolutely fascinating. Um, but I, I do have one more question um, that I would love all of you actually to respond to. So if you can think um, briefly about um, one learning that you would be taking away from your 2020 experience that will help you design the future in the long term so the next sort of five to ten years what would that learning be what's that key learning from you from that steep curve you've you've been on um this, this year for me i've been thinking a lot about transitions and what it is to be in that liminal space between one thing and between another and I think 2020 is a year of that for me personally um, feeling as though uh, it's a transitional year in it and, and actually it's hard to just limit it as as a year it's like we're going through something individually collectively we're not quite sure where that will end up and that's okay. And so trying to live in that in that sort of space of the unknown is something I've definitely been sitting with. And there's there's a couple of aspects to that. One is I loved your phrase, Melanie, about uh, stewarding compassionate endings. There's definitely part of this for me about how we um, tend to loss in all of its various forms. Uh, whether we're consciously trying to to let certain practices or habits or you know, processes and systems go, whether we're experiencing loss ourselves uh, on a personal level, but also how we can tend to the sort of emergent potential of the present and be okay that that's heading in a direction that is the right direction. And, and so on a personal level, a sort of a slightly philosophical answer is, is sort of living in that liminal space much more perhaps than in the past. Thank you, Ian. Elena? Um, I think for me, uh, it, it's, it's a learning out of a certain sense of, of the enormity of the task. Um, I think I've really, this year, I've, I've really come to terms with something that has been building for me for a number of years and that I think the pandemic has really brought out, which is just how much we need to begin to understand the way that the technical, the technology environment that we move in affects who we are, who I am personally, um, and, and who my son is and what he interacts with, right? And I think in the same way that designers have for decades understood that urban space determines a lot of how we experience life and how we experience reality and that other spaces that we move in, we also move in a technological space now. And it is not distinct, it is not separate um, from, from our life. And I think really coming to terms to that um, has, yeah, it's been a lesson for me because I think it's changed what I think is it, it's important to pay attention to. I think we really need to pay attention to um, the design of the technological spaces that we're moving in um, and how that's affecting the way we live our lives. And it's not down to individual behavior change in the same way that urban decay is not down to individual behavior change exclusively. Um, it's also down to collective design and, and collective decisions. Um, I think that's been a, a powerful thing for me this year. Thank you, Elena. Tom, would you like to share the learning? Yeah, I think, I think for me, um, learning that sharing and being open about your own personal vulnerabilities in difficult times is a really important thing to try and do as much as you possibly can because it creates 
space for others to do the same. And that not only builds strong relationships, but it opens up the space for people who may not consider themselves designers or, or, or whatever practitioner that you're working with at that time to, to, to bring the best of what they have to the table as well. Um, there's there's a twin thing, I suppose. One is about open, being open with vulnerability and the other is about being careful, as, as uh, Melanie and Ian were saying, um, about the language that we use um, and so as being as open with that as possible as well. So um, those two things, I think, create the space for, for exciting conversations, relationships and experiments. But um, you need to share the worst of yourself in order to get the best out of everyone. Great, thank you, Tom. And finally, Melanie. Thanks, Joanna. Um, well, it's been a, it's been a, uh, an odd year. Um, so I came home from the UK uh, uh, just during the bushfires, actually, um, to sort of an apocalyptic uh, Australia, and then into uh, into COVID. And so uh, for me, really, the learnings have been about. Um, I think just amplifying the need for compassion uh, and compassion in uh, my practice, but and compassion more broadly in the way that we sort of lean into that transitional space that we're in. Um, and it has really sort of cemented with me um, the, the deep uh, respect for the power of communities and sort of this real role that we all play in our social fabric of, of weaving that together um, with all of its colour and its joy and its glory. And um, uh, so I, I hope that taking that uh, really authentic and grounded view of that uh, through 2020 into uh, my practice moving forward um, will see us be able to continue to, to face into this, these transitions that are before us. Great, thank you, Melanie. So to recap on these learnings, um, so how do we live um, in a lineal space where there's lots of uncertainty? Um, how can we more proactively pay attention to the technological spaces we are designing? Um, how can we share the worst of ourselves to invite the best out of everyone? Um, and how do we amplify the need for compassion? Thank you all so much uh, for sharing your stories. Um, for those of you watching, you'll find links to Elena, Melanie, Tom and Ian's work on the RSA website. And while you're there, you can also find much more information on upcoming RSA events and podcasts as well as latest news from the RSA Student Design Awards team and from our Global Fellowship Network. Finally, we'd love uh, to hear your ideas about how design has responded to the unique challenges of 2020 and how it can continue to do so. Um, so do get involved in the conversation on social media using the hashtag RSA design. Um, we'll also be hosting a public hackathon in the new year based on the themes that have surfaced during this event. So stay tuned to find out more about this and how to book your place. It's been a fantastic conversation. So thank you again, Tom, Elena, Melanie, Ian, for joining us. Thank you to our partners at Ravensbourne University London, and thank you all for watching. <laughs>